Good morning, I'm Amy Gutman, and I'm president of the University of Pennsylvania and the chair of the Presidential Commission on the Study of Bioethical Issues. Uh, our co-chair, Jim Wagner, uh, will introduce the first session. We are now starting day two of our meeting on synthetic biology. Yesterday we heard from some of our Leading experts in synthetic biology, we received a very clear overview of the science. We learned about its likely future applications and benefits. We heard about some of the potential risks and other ethical concerns. Let me uh, emphasize that this is the first of three meetings on this topic. We have purposefully plan this meeting to be a primer or an overview. We will take deep dives um, in September at our next meeting at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, also open to the public September 13th to 14th, and at our November meeting at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, Today, we will continue to look at the ethical implications of this technology, as well as the issues related to federal oversight and regulation. Jim Wagner, President of Emory University and Vice Chair of the Commission, will introduce the first panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to our commissioners, uh, to our experts. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Excited to get this uh, second day going and hope it will be marked with the same uh, uh, frank and, and eager level, level of discussion that we enjoyed yesterday. This morning, as uh, Amy has said, our uh, first session is, is on ethics. Uh, we ended with a session on ethics yesterday. And we'll start today's panel hearing from uh, David Rajewski, who directs the Woodrow Wilson Center for Science and Technology Innovation. Uh, innovation program, excuse me, as well as its synthetic biology project. And before he joined the Wilson Center, uh, Mr. Jeske worked for the White House Office of Science and Technology on a variety of technology-related issues. David, welcome this morning. We look forward to your comments. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gutman and the whole commission, and also, also, also thank your staff which I think have done a, a great job in terms of supporting uh, everyone who has been involved. I've got some slides that I'm going to go through. Um, let me just start by saying you know, we've devoted about six years of our time um, in my project trying to essentially bring the voice or voices of the publics uh, into the conversation about science policy on emerging technologies. So we started with nanotechnology. Uh, we've continued with nanotechnology, and now we've added synthetic biology. Um, and I'm going to, in terms of how we do this, it's pretty easy. We talk to them. We go out and have fairly intensive and structured discussions with people all around the country. We've run lots of focus groups uh, in Spokane, Washington, and Dallas, Texas, Cleveland, Ohio, Baltimore. Uh, every year we do an annual survey with Heart Research. Um, we're going to be doing a new one in August on synthetic biology, in which we'll be asking questions about what happens if next year we produce our flu vaccine with synthetic biology. might be interesting to get public input on that question. Uh, we also do a lot of partnering with other groups that are doing similar kinds of research in this space and some work on media. So let me jump in and, and give you a sense of what we found out. Um, big question. What is this? <laughs> We've been grappling with this uh, for two days. So we asked people, how much have you ever heard about synthetic biology? These are the figures from 2008, 2009. They've actually increased somewhat. But at this point in time, 80% of the American public has heard little or nothing about synthetic biology. So who they hear from, what the message is, on how they hear it could have a huge impact on future trajectories of the technology and our ability to use it. Um, so you're in this, I think, very interesting space right now where people don't know much. Having said that, this is a complex word, and it tends to, um, I think, elicit a lot of concerns as soon as people hear it. It was very different from nanotechnology. People say, what is that? Uh, synthetic biology, um, people think about this through analogy, and the train goes something like this. Uh, synthetic biology, is that like artificial life? Um, 
is that cloning, is that stem cells, is that GMOs, right? And so within about 15 seconds, you've hit virtually every third rail issue that you might possibly hit. Right? Um, the term synthetic biology makes me think of genetic engineering and something lab-grown. Cloning is the image I think of. I think about molecular compounds and playing God. Okay, this is the public speaking right now. So um, this is kind of how you're starting off. Um, in order to kind of get around this, what we've done is we've tried to immediately kind of focus people on applications. Okay, um, we go past the science right in the applications. Last year we did a lot of work on biofuels uh, because that seems to be coming down the track very quickly. And the people's reactions to biofuels and the use of synthetic organisms and the engineering of metabolic pathways is largely one of conditional optimism. I think this is pretty good, but. And it's the buts that are interesting. Uh, this is positive. It all sounds wonderful, but my concern is that maybe by doing this we'll create something that we can't control. Here's another but. Once you start doing this, you open a Pandora's box, and we may start doing it for things that I don't approve of. You know, where are the boundaries? So when you start looking at this and break it down, you find that uh, a 30-30 split. People have concerns about um, the leakage into bioweapons, um, the moral issues about artificial life. Um, there's a lot of concerns actually about these environmental issues. Uh, could it you know, move in, in, in horizontal gene transfer? Uh, the other thing we played with last year was it seemed inevitable almost that somebody was going to create some form of synthetic life. Uh, we weren't sure who would do it, when it was going to happen. So we played with that question. Um, and here's what came out. Almost 100% of the people said more should be done to inform the public about this research. So you've got a fairly strong mandate. <laughs> um, the federal government should regulate this research. Two-thirds of the people said that. I'm worried about this over half. I'm excited about it less than half. This tracks fairly well with what's going on in Europe. Here's a, a recent statement uh, that came in Nature magazine. Without effective public engagement, there will be no synthetic biology in Europe. A pretty strong statement, I think. Uh, artific artificial life needs regulation. So this will give you some idea. I think there's a huge, huge hunger for public dialogue uh, on this issue. Um, the dark horse in synthetic biology's future is trust and whether we will trust the people that are essentially developing the technology, promoting the technology, or doing oversight on the technology. And so for the past uh, three years, we've actually um, tracked trust in agencies. Uh, you can see where the government agencies are, are kind of oscillating in the 50 to 60 percent range. This is a broad question about whether they trust these agencies to maximize benefits and, and, and minimize risks, which is kind of uh, what the commission is about. We added the DOE last year because of the biofuels work. Uh, the agencies beat the businesses. Um, so this issue of you know, who wins in the global race, I think uh, with, with synthetic biology will have a lot to do with how much social capital you have in your society. Um, and uh, there's huge variations. Uh, there's much more trust, for instance, in government and corporations in China right now than there is in the U.S., so this trust issue is sort of lurking in the background, and it's something we'll look at again this year. Uh, we've asked people, well, how do we build trust? With nanotech, we're going to be doing this in August with synthetic biology. Uh, we found essentially no public support for a moratorium on research. It always comes up, let's shut the system down. Uh, but we also found no public support really for self-regulation by industry. So this idea that industry is going to just look after itself and everything will be fine, uh, there's just not a lot of public belief that that's going to happen. When we ask people very specifically, uh, how can we build public confidence, uh, the thing that happens is 80% of their responses converge around three answers. They want greater transparency and disclosure about the science. They want pre-market testing. There's this feeling, there's this fear that we're taking technologies and pushing them into the market without doing the due diligence. The government isn't doing it. The corporations aren't doing it. Uh, and they also like the idea of third-party testing. So they bring up issues like, they bring up examples like Consumers Union or Underwriters Lab or people that are essentially above the fray or the National Academy of Sciences. Um, having industry do the testing is probably not going to work here. Okay, so then we, we, we sort of asked, where are people getting these ideas? Because they certainly aren't reading peer-reviewed literature. At least most people aren't. 
so here's the great filter. Uh, some of you might know this Gary Larson car cartoon. Uh, this is the scientist on the top and the media on the bottom. Now, if you think this is an exaggeration, this is what came out a few weeks ago. Uh, this was the Vetner Institute research. And these were, this is an analysis we did on the headlines in, in major uh, press outlets in the U.S. Uh, the size of the words essentially represent uh, the frequency uh, of their use. And a lot of people just skim the headlines anyway. Uh, so this is what they kind of got out of this. Craig creates synthetic life. Right? Now, if you think this is just an American phenomenon, we went back uh, a few weeks ago and, and to, did a bigger sample. We looked at the U.S., the U.K., and Germany. Um, that was the U.S. It's about synthetic life, folks. This is the U.K. It's about synthetic life. Uh, this is Germany, artificial life and Craig Bentner. Okay. So this is, this is working constantly. I'll come back to this a little bit, uh, a little, little later in terms of whether this is problematic and how to fix it. The other thing that happens is there's very different ways of covering it, we found in the U.S. and, and um, in the European Union. This is work that my colleague Eleanor Powell has done. Uh, we basically uh, looked at press for five years. Um, this is the U.S. press. Uh, we tend to be very bullish on benefits. Uh, this is the same pattern we had with nanotechnology and GMOs. Uh, so a lot of the articles talk about the benefits. Uh, very few talk about the risks. Uh, this is the European press, a little bit more balanced. The thing that's quite surprising is that then you break the things down into issues. These are the issues that appeared in the American press. Uh, synthetic biology has largely been framed here as a biosecurity issue. It's all about biosecurity. This is Europe. Biosecurity actually falls behind biosafety. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the ethics and a lot of discussion about what we call business issues, the IP issues and who owns this. Much more balanced, I think, coverage. And you can, I can imagine a divergence even in public opinion and public policy uh, between the two countries. Now, in the end, science has very little impact on public perceptions. Culture does. Um, the late novelist David Foster Wallace has made the comment that human beings are narrative animals. And that's how we understand science. So the, the sphere of public concern usually forms around threats rather than benefits. Uh, this is one of my favorite set of comics in the 50s, Captain Marvel in the Wonderful World of Mr. Atom. Uh, and the narrative there was the U.S. government really isn't paying attention to atomic energy and it falls into the hands of various evildoers. These are deep, deep narratives, and they're powerful because the science is essentially presented in the context of society and the people who do the oversight, uh, the people who want get, to get at it for bad purposes. It's a story, and we're storytellers. So when we've gone back and we've, we've sort of thought about the focus groups, there's a bunch of narratives that are incredibly powerful that come up again and again, and I'll give you three of them. Dr. Strangelove, uh, uh, this is dual use one, corruption of scientists. Um, this was in Spider-Man 2. Uh, if you've got teenagers, they probably watched Agent Cody Banks. And if you've got gamers, um, there's an Xbox 360 game called Bioshock. Uh, very powerful. It's built into every single media. The Trojan Horse, very, very powerful. Again, um, we accept these technologies into society, and we, we learn later that it was probably a mistake. Uh, DDT, CFC, Solidamide, Vioxx. Um, this is a game called Nano Breaker, same thing. The last one is, oops, <laughs> the accidental release of harmful, harmful substances due to a human and or technological error. Chernobyl, Bhopal, Michael Crichton's wonderful book, Prey, the release of, of nanobots from a military laboratory in the desert, and the new movie Splice, where genetic engineers have kind of crossed an ethical boundary and combined human and animal DNA. Um, so the thing that the scientists have to understand is people will fall back on these narratives long before they'll ever pick up a biology book. And they're incredibly pervasive, ubiquitous, and powerful. So let me uh, close up with some communication challenges. 
what is it? What is synthetic biology? We've, I, we actually have 11 or 12 definitions on our website. So I think five or six is an underestimate. Um, let me just make the comment that the scientist, industry, or government have no communication strategy about this at all. We're mumbling in real time. Okay, so it, it's, it's wrong quite often to blame the media. And the media has problems. But is, the scientific community has enormous problems in being able to communicate what this is. And conversely, we haven't told them what it isn't. Right? We had a discussion yesterday about whether this was cloning, and we never reached a conclusion. Right? So <clears throat> it's kind of open space for people's imaginations to operate in. And, it, and they will operate in it. Um, the other thing is, is this a big deal? Right? Who knows? I mean, if you look at the responses to Ventner's research, you go from Freeman Dyson, who thinks it's a turning point in the history of humanity, uh, to David Baltimore, who says, you know, Craig has overplayed this. Is this a big deal? Do we have any way of knowing? How would we? How would we communicate that? How does this impact individuals and in society? Uh, I think we went through a lot of that yesterday. I think, you know, Jim Thomas awakened us a little bit to the, the larger impacts we have to think about. And let me just tell you that people... People always impress me. Um, but the social context in which the public thinks is much broader than the social context in which most scientists think. They're going to ask very hard questions about who's developing this, who's promoting it, who wins, who loses, and what can go wrong. And those are nagging questions for which we have quite often no answers. I'm always impressed about how intelligent people are about this. What can go wrong? They constantly ask this, what can go wrong? And if something goes wrong, who's in charge? Where's the 800 number? Who do I call? Is it the White House? Is it FDA? Is it EPA? And the other question I think that's coming up now because of what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico is can we fix it? Can you plug the hole, Daddy? Right? As Obama's daughter has been asking him. So is there a biological blowout preventer? We've heard a lot of stuff about suicide genes and phenotypical handicapping. Can you do this and guarantee that it's not going to fail? And the public will ask questions like that. And I think we need to be prepared with answers. Um, so just some final thoughts. I think it, it makes sense potentially to launch a, a bigger national dialogue on synthetic biology. This is the one that the UK just did, um, which ran for I think eight or nine months. Uh, might be able to build off of the lessons that they learned. I think there's a need to actually set up a very visible coordinating office and body in the U.S. government. With nanotechnology, we had something called the nanotechnology, the National Nanotech Coordinating Office, uh, which did a lot of kind of outreach and inreach. And so there's a place to go to. Uh, it's not clear kind of where you go here. Um, this is going to happen soon. Uh, I, I predict within one year, someone in the Congress will ask the, the General Accountability Office to examine the adequacy of our regulatory system to address synthetic biology, and they should. Uh, the GAO would provide an independent assessment. Uh, they have the capacity to do that. Uh, they've moved into technology assessment, um, and I think we need to do this sooner rather than later. Uh, this was preempted because somebody actually suggested this, have the National Academy of Sciences undertake a new study of environmental impacts. Uh, the last time the Academy looked at biocontainment, it was 2004. Uh, the chapter on synthetic organisms is relatively weak uh, because they were very focused on, on animals, transgenic animals and plants. So it's time to take a, a hard look at this. And I also think people have to start looking at the potential for extremely low probability but high impact events. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, nuclear age, Herman Kahn at the RAND Corporation used to say we need to think the unthinkable. Uh, we need to look at what people call black swans, things that, that really could be game changers uh, that we're not thinking about. And finally, I think it's time to really engage in, in greater international collaboration, not just around biosecurity. I think a lot of that's happening, but around issues like risk research, intellectual property issues, and this one that's kind of coming up again and again as we talk is the biosafety issues. So that's uh, my comments. Um, all of the things that I've referred to are up on our website. Um, the work we do is funded by the, the Sloan Foundation. So.
Thank David, you. thank you uh, very, very much. Let's, let's move right along, and we'll get to Q&A later. Our next speaker is Marcus Schmidt. And Dr. Schmidt is the co-founder and board member and project leader at the Organization for International Dialogue and Conflict Management in Austria. Dr. Schmidt has conducted several European Commission research projects on ethical aspects of synthetic biology, and we certainly look, welcome you and look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the Commission for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And I think it shows the commitment of the Commission to uh, have this uh, bioethical discussion and debate on synthetic biology uh, drawn on the international level. Uh, in the light of this, I will not try to hide my lovely Austrian accent throughout the presentation. <laughs> Um, you have asked me to give an introduction and overview about uh, what's going on in Europe in terms of social and ethical aspects of synthetic biology. Uh, I have 15 minutes for that and try to do my best uh, to do this. Um, as an overview, uh, first of all, I would try to give you an idea of what we think falls under the umbrella term of synthetic biology rather than to give a definition to just see what's going on and who's doing what and say a little bit about uh, the role of Europe compared to U.S., a bit about the funding, uh, what the European Ethics Councils are doing, what they've found, what kind of recommendations they're giving, and give some examples of uh, ELSI projects in Europe. Can I this, uh, pointer? Pointer. Okay. Right. So um, we have uh, heard something about uh, maybe the different definition and what is included in synthetic biology, what it's not, it's cloning, stem cells. So uh, it took me quite a long time. I'm, I'm working in synthetic biology for five years now, and it took me a little bit in order to, to grasp that. I think we can make out five different subfields or um, under the umbrella of synthetic biology. The first one is DNA synthesis or synthetic genomics. It's uh, the reason why this committee has been put in, uh, in place by Barack Obama, what uh, Craig Winter is doing. I think um, you can uh, maybe also call that uh, uh, China, it's, uh, synthetic genomics is like uh, the Gutenberg of biology, right? Um, and maybe the step ahead, uh, ahead, you can say that um, uh, if, if synthetic genomics can create life, is as pertinent a question to ask if Gutenberg has created the Bible, right? So it's about uh, printing, right? But not um, Gutenberg was not a Shakespeare or Voltaire or um, Goethe. So this is an attempt by the second group um, uh, category, which is DNA-based biocircuits, the creation of a biological system made of parts or genes, and we have heard that uh, we still have limitations in doing so but it's uh, going on. The third, the third um, group is working on a minimal genome to reduce a genome on a living cell to the extent it can barely survive, to know about the, the least complex living systems and uh, to be used as a chassis for the second type. So the first three types are actually, uh, you can say this is life as we know it, right? So they're using more or less similar principles of, uh, of natural organisms. The second, the next two um, parts are actually uh, descriptions and attempts to make life as we don't know it. Protocells uh, research, uh, here are researchers that are trying to make cells from, the, from scratch, from, from basic inanimate chemicals, putting them together in a way so that uh, uh, one point in the future this will have all the characteristics of life. I think this would be the, the category where you can say that they're trying to make um, real synthetic life, synthetic cells. And the last part is uh, on chemical synthetic biology, there are attempts to to diversify the biochemistry of life, for example, to have uh, a DNA with six, eight, or 12 bases instead of just four, or to, uh, to replace desoxyribose in the DNA and put in other chemicals like three euros, then have TNA, and these things would be orthogonal or very different from natural organisms, and we could have uh, a kind of genetic enclave or biological firewall as a safety system. All right. Um, comparing Europe to the U.S., um, there are many ways to do that. Um, I, I go, went to the PubMed uh, uh, website and found that, well, okay, U.S. is, uh, is ahead in terms of publications, also in terms of uh, receiving funding for the work, but Europe is uh, the second to the United States. So it's, uh, I think together we may, might have uh, 80 or 90 percent of the synthetic biology um, volume uh, capacity in the world. Uh, but Europe uh, uh, is very diverse and heterogeneous. There is, on the one hand, a European Commission funding initiative, but on the other hand, there are also national uh, initiatives, but they're very different. In some countries, there's a good uh, research uh, community, but there's lack of funding, like in France. In Austria, we have a good LC community, but there are hardly any um, scientists working on that. The best case, uh, the benchmark in Europe is 
Certainly in the UK, we have uh, communities of synthetic biologists. They have funding. Same is true for LC research community. And they are also even required to work together and to collaborate. So they, they, they set um, a good uh, example for Europe. So all these uh, publications, work, and um, funding in Europe on synthetic biology have uh, asked, so, so, um, have drawn to the attention um, the fact that there might be bioethical issues involved, and there have been a couple of bioethics committees in Europe working on this or not working on this. So the first example here is the UK, where the Nuffield Council on Bioethics has repeatedly uh, decided not to work on synthetic biology in 2006, 7, and 8 because they thought it's not relevant. But in contrast to that, many other countries have. For example, Germany, there were different um, ethics councils. Um, and there's, for example, the ethics council of the German parliament and the German ethics council, which is, if you have seen the life of, uh, uh, life of Brian by Monty Biden's, like the uh, Judea's people front and the people front of Judea, so they're not quite clear. But <laughs> they, have, they have, yeah. Um, so at first, uh, the, the German ethics council said it's not relevant. Uh, they didn't want to work on that. Um, but the Ethics Council Chairman Parliament said, well, it might be relevant, and now I think the German Ethics Council is doing something on that as well. But, okay. um, Switzerland actually had a very interesting publication recently coming out, the Federal Ethics Committee on Non-Human Biotechnology. It's an awful long word in German. And uh, they, they looked especially on the, um, so the non-physical non harm part of, uh, uh, of synthetic biology. So the deontological ethics, the, the dignity of, of uh, microbes. So we're looking at microbes, and if they, if we can treat these microbes like machines, or if, if they have a special category, and they entertain different positions, like biocentric position, theocentric, uh, ecocentric, and so on. So they, they came to the conclusion that the majority of people in this comedy uh, entertain a hierarchical biocentric view. They say that, well, microbes are not machines, they're alive, and they have a dignity, but this dignity is much less or not that important as other higher animals so, uh, and organisms, so we can use them in any way we want. Actually, it's a green light for scientists, and they were very happy to, to hear that the scientists and had nothing to add to that. Uh, also in the Netherlands, the, there was uh, the co-chair made, made um, a statement. But I would like to say a little bit about um, the European Commission itself. In 2008, President Barroso asked uh, his bioethics uh, committee, the European Group on Ethics and Science and New Technologies, to also have uh, organized uh, recommendations or to to come up with an opinion paper, which they did uh, and published that in, in November last year. And uh, very interesting, I think, yesterday you asked, what is our one recommendation to you? It could be that you might want to look at this, uh, their recommendations and see if there's something you can um, uh, use. As I mentioned before, biosafety is really an important uh, topic in Europe, mu uh, much more than biosecurity. I think that there's really a, a one major difference between the US and, and Europe. And there are several points on biosafety, especially that we need to uh, develop risk assessment methods so that we can in the future try to assess the risks of new uh, synthetic biology tools and methods. Otherwise, we would run into a situation where we have just uncertainties. They also entertain the idea of labeling products that come out of synthetic biology. They don't want to do it. It's just an idea that they could do. Uh, include the biosafety standard when, when doing import-export with synthetic biology products and um, promote public debate. Uh, and also that, that it's necessary to support public um, uh, support for basic research and, and LC work. Here I got a, a time a timeline of different projects dealing with societal ethical aspects in Europe. Uh, I say the color code doesn't have any meaning; it's just uh, it's more colorful. And um, some of the projects are standalone LC projects; others are, are science projects where they have an LC part. Some of the, some of them deal with uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, in order to, to map the different projects uh, in this in this virtual world, you know, uh, Europe has a history of colonizing, and now we do that anymore. So we have this virtual world here, five different uh, areas of synthetic biology and different LC aspects. Okay, so and also try to map the different projects into this uh, virtual world. Uh, you see that the, most of the activities are going on in biosafety and ethics, and most of them in regarding DNA-based biocircuits, right? There's there so also initiatives in DNA synthesis, the IASP initiative on that. There, there are some activities in science and society um, and, and socioeconomics. And I would like to, in my last uh, couple of slides, present some of these uh, projects I know best and have been part of. The first one is uh, SynBiosafe, which was the, uh, the first uh, European project on safety and ethical issues in synthetic biology. It was, a, in, a, in a way, a pilot study to, to map 
fields and see if there's anything new in safety and ethics. And uh, what we did is in, in our ethical part, we found out that, well, the ethical aspects that may come up in Syntec Voucher can be attributed to the three different areas, whether it's about its applications, that would be like human enhancement. Now, we, now for example, there's, uh, we can do synthetic human chromosomes that uh, can be used for, for gene therapy, that would be an issue, or related to its distribution. It's what we heard yesterday with the bioeconomy, what is the, the effect of, of synthetic biology on the global justice uh, and a distribution of wealth and benefit, or to the procedure as such, so that the ontological status of living machines. Regarding biosafety, we have, uh, I have like three questions or, or, or challenges. The first one is uh, we need to find new methods in risk assessment in order to make sure we can uh, have some certainty about the risks of new products in synthetic biology. Second is what are the ways to improve synthetic biology Biosafety, uh, to improve uh, the biosafety by using tools of synthetic biology. For example, I mentioned before the, the different uh, DNA with different chemicals where you would have an orthogonal system or different forms of oxotrophy where you feed them with things that don't occur in nature and so on and so forth. And the third one, third point is about uh, what happens if non professionals, amateurs, and do it yourself people uh, start using that. In addition to some publications and, uh, and a book that we've wrote, we also uh, thought it was necessary to uh, produce some material for the general public so they would get more and more people uh, interested and motivated to enter the discussion. And we did uh, this documentary film. I brought uh, two copies for the commission here. Um, you can get more information on this website. Um, starting from this more general assessment of, um, let's say, risk and benefits, uh, another project here, TARPOL, which is the abbreviation for Targeting Environmental Pollution with Engineered Microbial Systems a la carte, is uh, from the uh, European Commission's seventh framework program. On bio, um, we, we are looking into specific applications where synthetic biology could make contribution and try to find out um, uh, what, what its economic, environmental, and uh, social impact would be. Okay? So um, this is going to be published in September, so this is a draft. So I can, if you want, I can send you this, uh, the final uh, version. So we have, for example, in biofuels, we look into ethanol, non-ethanol, like butanol kind of uh, fuels, algae-based fuels, biohydrogen, and microbial fuel cells, and uh, try to evaluate uh, the different aspects. So this is a way to, to go away from a very general assessment to a more case-by-case -case, um, assessment. Another project with the, that we've done in Austria is COSI, Communicating Synthetic Biology, where we wanted to know more about public perception. Um, this is in the light of um, um, a certain lack of knowledge about synthetic biology, although we have in the last couple of years more and more press articles, uh, in this case in the German language media, but it's very similar in other countries in Europe. But there, uh, certainly most of the people haven't heard about this term. It's very similar to the United States. And I can uh, give another hint. In next September, uh, the, Eurobarometer, the new, newest Eurobarometer study is going to be released. This is a, every th three years, the European Commission is doing a massive poll, opinion poll in Europe. So they're asking a total of 30,000 people uh, in Europe uh, on different uh, aspects of biotechnology. And for the first time, we were able to slip in some questions on synthetic biology. And it's going to be, I've seen the results, but I can't tell you yet because it's published in September. It's going to be out there. It's going to be very, uh, probably useful for you. So what we're doing then in, in this, in this uh, lack of uh, knowledge and awareness, we were doing a, a real-time experiment, uh, asking scientists to write, write press releases, asking real journalists to write articles, and gave that to uh, eight focus groups uh, consisting of different, um, different parts of the, of the public. And what, what we found is that, uh-huh, Yes, okay. Um, these are the eight groups, right? And at the beginning, and, and, and the scale is uh, if the people uh, would be rather positively inclined or rather negatively or neutral. So at the beginning, because they didn't know anything, they, they're all um, more or less neutral. So they don't have any opinion on synthetic biology. Actually, there sh should be the, the name should be here as well. Uh, and it turns out that after they received the articles, we see that uh, like the majority, like half of the groups, they didn't change their opinion. They, they still they didn't still um, seem to involve them a lot. But uh, two groups had a suddenly very negative opinion, and two groups suddenly get a quite positive opinion on that, right? So this, this group on the left was a, an environmental NGO, and this group was a Christian NGO. And here we got students, and these are members from the economic chambers. 
So uh, it turns out that the synthetic biology has the, the, the potential to polarize parts of the public, while we have a so-called maybe a silent mass of people that don't care a lot, but of course um, the people on, on the fringes. Interesting, we also found that uh, in this communication process from science to media to the public, actually the very essence of synthetic biology got lost. So while at the beginning the scientists were talking about why it was different from genetic engineering, they had the standardization, these engineering principles, you know, this got lost and, and in, in favor of uh, a more application focused um, kind of information that was uh, conveyed. And this is important from the point of view of, of journalists because they want to write something that is relevant for people and it's about uh, applications. So, and so because they just talk about applications, not about the method behind it, people cannot make a difference between synthetic biology, genetic engineering, or biotechnology. So they, they put it all together. So that's uh, a result from this communication process that these this nuances that get totally lost. So this is my last slide. Um, here's a, a, we heard yesterday that if synthetic biology is successful, imagination will be the limit, right? So if this is really the case, I think we should uh, invite people that are experts in imagination and uh, maybe not only engineers. And so we're inviting filmmakers and artists to, to give us their vision of what synthetic biology could, um, how, they, how it could change our society in the future. And we're going, going to do a science, art, and film festival at the Museum of Natural History next year in Vienna. And we're still uh, 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 inviting people to send us uh, short films. And I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, festival. With that, i will like to thank the commission for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, very, very interesting to see the uh, sort of European response to the challenge that uh, challenge for public dialogue that uh, David Rzeski uh, issued to us. Our final speaker in this morning's panel, um, I have a special pleasure to introduce. It's Dr. Paul Root Wolpe. He is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Bioethics and Director of the Center for Ethics at Emory. And uh, Dr. Wolpe sits on the editorial board of more than a dozen professional journals as the past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. His work focuses primarily, primarily on the social, religious, and ideological impact of biotechnology on the human condition. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you here, Paul, and we look forward to what you have to say. Well, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm a sociologist, social scientist, and very atypically for me, I will not be using slides. So uh, we'll see if I can, you know, how some people can't talk without their hands. We'll see if I can actually talk without a PowerPoint presentation. I was very pleased at the breadth of ethical concerns that were expressed yesterday because it freed me up to talk about what I think are some less often considered and, and in some ways perhaps more underlying or deeper ethical uh, concerns that I have. Um, concerns that are as troubling in some ways as ecological or pathogenic concerns, but much more difficult, I think, to know how to address. My assignment today, what I was asked to do, was talk about um, religious perspectives on SynBio. And I spent a few weeks um, reading the literature. I spoke to uh, people from a variety of faith traditions, from Buddhism with uh, Emory's wonderful um, Tibet, Emory Tibet uh, program that we have, uh, people from Islam, Christianity and Judaism, uh, Hinduism. And what I discovered was that there was remarkable agreement about SynBio, and that is at this point they're unconcerned. That fundamentally their objections or their concerns were those of all of us in this room. What are the potential harms? What might happen if these things are released into the environment? Um, and they expressed a... Um, concern that SynBio keep its eye on maximizing human good and uh, reducing suffering, and if it does that, it's, success it's uh, acceptable. And that was reflected, I think, in the Vatican's response, for example, to SynBio, um, where they said that the recent cre creation of uh, uh, Venter's cell can be a positive development if correctly used, and then there was a warning afterwards, but scientists should be careful about um, playing God, creating life, remembering that only God can do that. I find the questions that we typically ask of religious traditions about bioethical issues to be relatively uninteresting. We focus too much on asking for their imprimatur, 
for them to sanction what science is doing. But I don't really think that's the right question that we should be asking of religious traditions. It's not where they can make their greatest contributions in telling us what we should or should not do. Rather, I think that modern science is simply the newest means of trying to struggle with eternal questions about how to minimize human suffering, what our proper relationship is to the natural world, what are the important problems we as a species must solve, and so on. Religious traditions have had centuries to think about these questions, and the smartest people of their age throughout most of human history drifted into religious dialogue, and so those traditions hold fonts of wisdom that we can draw from. We know that the role of science is generating knowledge. What I think is most valuable role of religious traditions, what I really think we should ask of them, is how to generate wisdom, which is a different quality than knowledge alone. And so for a few minutes, I want to talk about what kind of wisdom might we glean about SynBio and similar biotechnologies. Um, these aren't going to be the points that are usually made explicitly by religious traditions or religious spokesmen, nor do they come from particular religious traditions. They come rather from what I think of as a kind of generalized religious sensibility, a posture that asks what our positions might be if we start from the premise that there's something sacred about our lives, even if you define that word sacred in its most secular sense. The sensibil religious sensibility that I mean is shared by a variety of people of faith and by people of no particular religious faith, by both the theist and the agnostic and the atheist. It begins with the premise that life is rare and precious, that our biosphere is fragile and singular and, in, and of inestimable value, and that we have evolved to be the stewards of the planet and very powerful stewards at that. And one last point before I move on to the, uh, the specific points I want to make. I don't think wisdom is at all an exclusive domain of religion. Uh, we find it in art, we find it in literature, and we find it in science as well. In fact, if you look at science's impact on religion over the last hundred years or more, we see as profound an impact going in that direction as we do in religion's um, influence on science. So I'm interested in that dialogue between science and religion to some degree and how they can mutually inform each other, and that is a uh, dialogue of longer duration and greater productivity than is generally appreciated. So I want to give four examples of what I think of as some ethical issues that are, are, are difficult and perhaps even intractable, um, but might reflect this generalized sense that I'm um, referring to. First is the idea that human beings are co-created by technology. We think of ourselves as the creators of technology, which we then somehow send into the world, and then we create the next technology and send it into the world we pay far less attention to the ways that the technologies we create then reciprocally recreate us, recreate human beings, and recreate human society. The invention of the plow shaped human societies for millennia. Modern civilization itself was largely a product of plow-based agriculture. The automobile made suburban life possible, moved industry out of the cities, and even perhaps ended the era when people had to keep animals for transportation and thus estranged us from the natural world even more. Computers, we don't even need to mention how computers have fundamentally changed us, not just the so social, economic, and synthetic biology results of computer power, but even um, parents being unable these days to figure out how to communicate with their own children, who have a whole different system of communication than many parents do. Yesterday, we heard some speculations of how SynBio might contribute to bioeconomic dislocation. Powerful technologies can change social relationships, change how we think about problems. New technologies create new problems that call for even newer technologies to solve them, which then create their own challenges, which we address with even newer technologies, which is why we always seem to have both too much technology and not enough technology at the same time. So how will SynBio change us? I, I have no idea. I don't think anybody does. Perhaps it will accelerate the biomedicalization of life, whereby diverse human phenomena are recast and redefined primarily by their biomedical nature. Perhaps it will change our personal self-conception from one that thought of individuality as a variation on our commonality 
to one emphasizing our polymorphic divergences and idiosyncrasies. Perhaps it will be the final step in the commodification of living things, whereby all biological forms will be thought of primarily in terms of their utility. I don't know. It's too early to tell and premature probably for the commission to speculate on. But I think we all agree that looking at technology in isolation from the economic, social, philosophical, and political implications of its future development is to fail to fulfill the deepest meaning of the president's charge to explore the implications of the field. The second issue is speed. And this is a point that I think is often overlooked in talking about um, technological change. Speed itself is an ethical issue. We live in a society that explicitly and implicitly presents speed as an ethical value. Taking a longer time to achieve similar results is seen as less desirable, as wasting time. Doing something faster is doing it better. Synthetic biology and genetic engineering as well justify their utility in part, as we heard yesterday, on how they have dramatically collapsed the time horizon of evolutionary change, as Drew Wendy pointed out. Yet speed is a problematic value. Selective breeding, for example, is limited, difficult, and time-consuming. And so in that sense, uh, genetic technologies are an improvement. But because it plays out over long periods of time, it allows for reflection and self-correction. Change happens slowly, which offers a large range of choices at each new increment of intervention. SynBio collapses that whole long process into a single step. Yet it may take many generations to understand the impact of even a single gene change on the integrity of an organism as a whole. It may take many generations to appreciate harmful impacts genetic alterations may have on human consumption or on the environment. Even cisgenic transfers may have consequences that differ from selective breeding. So speed has an impact on our deliberations in two senses. One, in the ways that Symbio speeds up natural processes, and second, in the explosive development routinization and dissemination of synthetic biology technologies and methodologies themselves. How do we think about, accommodate, and understand the ethical implications of speed? The third is incrementalism. It's a difficult dilemma. We can follow a path where every step is examined individually and found to be ethically unobjectionable, and yet 100 steps later we find ourselves in a place that no one wants to be. The idea is also captured by the fact that most Symbio research uh, findings advance our knowledge incrementally, and yet somehow we see the enterprise as a whole as transformative. One of the reasons for behavior-based religious systems like halakha in Judaism or sharia in Islam or for the Vinaya discipline of monastic Buddhism is exactly to guard against uh, uh, incrementalism uh, and it's what is seen in these religious traditions as a kind of pernicious potential to drift slowly away from what each tradition sees as right paths. I think, in fact, it is actually a kind of incrementalism that people are trying to combat when they resist biotechnological change or resist um, an enterprise like Symbio or nanotechnology. Perhaps it's even really what underlies the playing God objection to some degree. And so when we respond that we've been playing God since Homo habilis first produced stone tools, I'm not really sure that that addresses the incrementalist question that underlies it. Yes, we have been playing God along the way, but is there some point in which our changes to our natural environment, our changes to our physiological integrity, our changes to our fellow creatures has crossed some line, though the line is obscured by the fact that this step really isn't that much advanced from the step before us. It presents a real policy challenge. How do I say the step A is okay and B is okay and C is okay, but D isn't okay when D is really indistinguishable in many ways from C, and the real reason I want to stop is D is because I see H down the line. How do you create a policy that captures the subtlety of incrementalism? It's it's very, very difficult, and perhaps the best way is to address it in a positive way by creating goals and incentives rather than trying to stop things. And the fourth point is what I call the fetishization of progress. And this comes, and this is uh, something that is often expressed by religious traditions. A fetish is defined as any object, idea, etc., 
eliciting unquestioning reverence, respect, or devotion. Got that right out of the dictionary. I submit that the, that description characterizes the general cultural posture of many people and most scientists towards scientific progress. Here, religions have a lot to say. A report of the Executive Committee of the European Ecumenical Commission for Church and Society wrote, our Christian heritage teaches us to be skeptical of romantic notions of unrestrained human improvement and scientific progress that prevail in some parts of the scientific and political communities. Our support for scientific research is moderated by our awareness of human finiteness and fallibility. Scientific progress is itself a secular faith. Modern biotechnological science has a history of failed prediction and hyperbole from predictions of uh, gene therapy that I was very involved in early in my career to the claims early on that nanotechnology is going to solve hunger and our energy problems and everything and, and virtually everything else. While the cautions of some temperists in our scientific zeal are easy to dismiss, there's wisdom in pausing periodically to question scientific utopianism, the argument of urgency, and other underlying assumptions of some biotechnological advocacy. Perhaps here it might be instructive to conclude, uh, as both the previous um, speakers alluded to, by drawing from two narrative traditions or two narrative tales, one coming from a secular tradition, uh, Christian tradition and the other from my own Jewish tradition. There are two tales uh, in addition to Dr. Strangelove and Oops and the other things that David was saying that I think have become very much paradigmatic in this area. And the first is the tale of Frankenstein. The Frankenstein tale is a product of a Christian cultural milieu that had underpinnings of suspicion and worry about technology. In fact, by the way, and what isn't usually commented on, is this whole idea of playing God is a very Christian idea. It doesn't really exist in Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, or Buddhism, uh, all of which are, are much, much more historically um, uh, predisposed to science than certain strains of Christianity though that's not true, of course, of all strains of Christianity. The story of Frankenstein is a scientific one. Anyone with the right technological knowledge can manipulate life and create it. Some of you may remember Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein, where, where Gene Wilder breaks into his grandfather's laboratory, and there's a book called How I Did It. Right? So you just have to follow the formula, and you can do it too. To Shelley, the creation of human life is clearly improper, Dr. Frankenstein transgresses. Christianity and European thought condemn him. Frankenstein is monster, is a monster, is a freak. The story of the golem is quite different. The golem is created by a great rabbi, Rabbi Lau, to safeguard his people. He's not condemned by, for creating the golem, nor is it prohibited. In fact, the Talmud accepts the creation of life, and there are many stories of rabbis creating goats and life and uh, goats and human beings and other forms of life. And Lowe considered the golem an extension of the natural part of the co-creation with God. Unlike Frankenstein, by the way, who was created by putting together biological parts, the golem is a symbio creation. Uh, Rabbi Lowe brings it to life by writing three letters of a religious genetic code on his forehead, and then, um, you know, he's, he's alive. But there are two differences in the last second uh, between these stories that I want to leave us with. Victor Frankenstein is portrayed by Shelley as a driven man, arrogant, who displays a number of examples of personal cowardice in his story. His temper is violent, his passion strong. When the monster disappears from his house, he's relieved and he flees instead of taking responsibility. In contrast, only the most righteous can create a golem, can manipulate life, and the degree of technological success is correlated with their degree of righteousness. Um, by breathing life into the clay, Rabbi Lowe emulates God and so sees as his responsibility to emulate other godly qualities. And if we look at that biotechnology and biological science research council report that was put in the packet, you will see that the, one of the biggest concerns among the public was the motivation and disposition of scientists making the research, whether they could afford dignity and responsibility and respect when intervening in a national, natural world. And finally... Uh, the second and last point I want to make about these two stories is Dr. Frankenstein loses control of his namesake. There is no safety mechanism built into the monster, and ultimately Frankenstein must pursue his creation, and he dies trying unsuccessfully to end the monster's life. While the golem always remains under the control of its creator, Rabbi Lowe builds a safety valve into the golem, and when he gets out of control, he simply has to remove one letter from its forehead, and it turns back into clay, 
And it's heartening to see the leaders of Symbio have taken that idea of the safety valve um, seriously and built it into their products. So uh, to the commission, I've, st I've tried to highlight three or four what I think of as very difficult issues, and I think the challenge to the commissions, it seems to me, is to take the extraordinary knowledge presented to us by Symbio and temper it with wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I do want to defer first to, to our chair, but we have questions already from the commission. It's up to you. Uh, I'll, I'll wait for my question and go straight to the commission and ask mine later. John? Well, thank you all very much. Uh, Paul, first I want to reassure you that it's perfectly okay not to use PowerPoint. Uh, I, I believe that PowerPoint is the spawn of Satan. Uh, <laughs> So my, I, my I actually, I actually applaud you for not using it. Uh, uh, the commission will not take a position. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'll be working on you all. Um, so uh, I want to begin with this reflection on the, on the absence of trust uh, with regard to these sorts of scientific developments. Um, I think that Dr. Rajeski is, is correct that we're, this, this is the social environment in which we are working here. It's, a, it's, an, it's an environment marked by an absence of trust. Um, and we see this all around us with regard to BP, with regard to uh, climate gate, uh, and so on, where there's just a high degree of suspicion with regard to all of our major institutions, the church, science, business, government, everything. Um, so in this kind of environment, I think you're right that some kind of public outreach, public engagement will be absolutely crucial. And I've read your excellent article, David, in the, in the reader, um, which does talk about the importance of engagement with the public. Um, but I, I think we need to probe that a little bit deeper to get at the, at the rationale for doing so. I mean, one rationale could simply be to sort of work on the public, you know, to sort of massage the public or tweak the public in various ways in order to make the world safe for scientific development. Another way of thinking about it, which I think is much more plausible and philosophically appropriate, is to, is to view public engagement as a way to obtain public legitimacy. Um, in other words, if the public sees itself as having a role in the formulation of public policy, uh, that bestows a certain amount of legitimacy on the project. And I think we can see this. There are, we have anecdotes right now so far. We have anecdotes. We have a couple of case studies in this, uh, one of my favorites is the, is the rationing program in the state of Oregon, uh, where public officials in Oregon basically reached out to the public, engaged them in a prolonged discussion, and it turns out that in the state of Oregon, people can, the state can ration health care in a rational, transparent, and effective way that gain public acceptance. Uh, so I'm wondering what you think about the prospects of this kind of public engagement in the area of synthetic biology. Uh, is there any evidence that this kind of engagement will indeed engender le increased legitimacy, or is it just a kind of theoretical notion that, you know, involves a lot of hand-waving? Yeah, I think there's there's always um, a certain amount of a, a skepticism and a fear of doing this. And, and I think the scientific community has often used this deficiency model, uh, which is uh, the public simply doesn't get it, right? Uh, and if they only got the science, they'd get on board. Um, and part of the problem is, of course, the public is asking a different set of questions. Um, I think one of the problems that you run into immediately is if it, you wait too long, it appears disingenuous. Um, so this happened to a, a, a large public engagement 
process in the UK called GMO Nation, um, where it really started after, you know, the science, it, it essentially it looked to the public like the, the train had left the station. Mm -hmm. um, and so the it GMO very, Nation is like their worst fear. <laughs> right, it's their worst fear. Um, and recently the French uh, conducted a large national um, engagement process on nanotech, and it was actually shut down in a number of sites uh, by protests. Uh, again, because people felt, well, look at you already, nanotech products are on the market. We, we've essentially done this before. Um, so I think part of it is there's a timing issue. And so I think if you really are serious about this, uh, it has to be done fairly soon. Uh, the report that we just put out on participatory technology assessment says that there are ways of doing this that are extremely uh, well tested. Uh, we've done 16 of these types of, of exercises in the U.S. alone, um, and they're used pretty widely in Europe. And this is just a matter of getting a, mm. a representative sample. One of the things you'll, you'll grapple with, and I'm sure you'll be asked, is are the people you're talking to representative? You know, and that's a statistical question mm -hmm. and a methodological question you'll have to deal with. Um, so I think there's one of the things that there was an interesting um, um, process that was run on biomonitoring in Boston. Uh, this was done a few years ago. It brought in a wide range of people from the public, fairly representative sample, to talk about monitoring. And it was visited at the same time by the head of the National Academy panel that was doing uh, essentially an investigation on biomonitoring for the U.S. government. And his response was he was stunned um, at the, the, the sort of the level of conversation by, by an informed public because you, you actually have to inform the people of what's going on. Uh, and the fact that they actually came up with new ideas, I, I think it goes beyond legitimacy. I think they, they actually, people can generate new ideas, new ideas for policy, things you hadn't thought about. So I think it's not just sort of educating. It's not sort of dumping knowledge. Uh, it's not just trying to get some legitimacy by having a dialogue. It's also the fact that mm -hmm. people are smart. Uh, they get this stuff. And, and that's why when we've done our public um, focus groups, we, off, we float a lot of public policy ideas, uh, and people come back. We say, what do you think about labeling? What do you think about a moratorium? Uh, what should the FDA do? What can they do to build your trust? So I, for me, it's always, I come from a policy world, and so I, I think the use of these as ways of informing public policy is, is actually very, very critical. So I, I, would, I would push you to actually go beyond the legitimacy issue and just having the dialogue and sort of say, well, how can I learn something from millions of people, or at least a representative sample of millions of people? Uh, so I have two questions. First, I want to thank Mr. Rodusky for your specific recommendations. I thought they were incredibly helpful, and um, and your study, I think, is really quite enlightening for us as well. My questions are actually directed to um, uh, to Dr. Wolpe. So the first one, I, I was quite surprised uh, when you said that there was no religious perspective or difference, at least with, within the religious community. Um, and I wonder if that was a representative population that you spoke to, because um, I would expect that there may be some differences, particularly around the questions of life, um, dualistic versus materialistic concerns about the creation of life. Uh, and so um, I wonder if it's a, a question of awareness of the degree to which synthetic biology is being included under sort of a large umbrella, um, and whether or not you think that there may be concerns that develop. Let me just ask you the second question um, for next, which is, your answer to incrementalism and to the rate of change was that mm -hmm. we should create goals and incentives um, to uh, keep in mind as, as a way to direct us. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you have specific ideas as to what those goals and incentives are, and if so, how they would address the questions about shifting the rate of change in the environment. Um, thank you. I, I wasn't trying to say that there aren't religious objections um, to synthetic biology. There are some religious groups that object to virtually the entire modern scientific enterprise. Um, I spoke to um, mo mostly official or high place spokesmen from religion, these religious traditions, asking them what their religious traditions say specifically about this particular case of the creation of the artificial cell. And what I got in response from almost all of them was at this point, um, the actual act of creating a synthetic genome and, and inserting it into a cell that replicates is not one that we have any particular ideological or theological objection to. So I, I asked a very narrow question. So it was not about synthetic biology generally or their views about it. Yeah. Right. And, and insofar as the conversation then went on as it invariably did to where their 
problems lie, they tended to all be down the road or they tended to be in this more intrinsic issue of hubris or of proper limits to human intervention or of humility or issues like that. And I think part of the reason for that is that synthetic biology is a nascent enterprise and like us, nobody really knows what all the implications of it are. So there's a let's wait and see attitude. But religious traditions, especially outside Christian religious traditions, tend to see the use of other forms of life to better human life as a legitimate enterprise within certain limits. And so creation of synthetic biology products that would cure disease or help with things like mitigating pollution are seen as legitimate scientific goals. The issue of incrementalism, the reason that I'm suggesting positive incentives rather than regulatory limits is because nobody knows and I certainly don't know where to put regulatory limits. And as I say, it always seems arbitrary. And therefore, in some sense, it's a very practical difficulty that leads me to suggest that positive incentives are a better policy strategy. At this point, I think it's premature to suggest where the proper goals of synthetic biology are. That needs a little bit more time, but it is exactly what we do in medicine, of course. So we create the NIH and the NIH looks at all the, it is the steward of public funds. It looks at all the possible places that it could invest public funds and it makes value decisions about what kinds of medical products, goals, cures, preventions are best in the best public interest and then it incentivizes the system to try to move in those directions. So it was that, and that's what NSF does. Of course, it's what all of our public funding agencies and private funding agencies do. So I was just suggesting that it's such an intractable problem, the problem of incrementalism, that that is a better strategy, even though I don't really have a specific recommendation at this point about what specific goals that incentive program should pursue. Thank you. I'd like to ask Dr. Rajewski perhaps to be a little more granular in your thoughts about how you would organize the lack of a communication plan, certainly in this country, I think compared to Dr. Schmidt's presentation, it was a fairly, I think, stark support for that comment. How would you suggest, based on your comments of yesterday, that you wanted more government agencies to, quote, be in the room to be part of this process, and yet when you went through your five specific recommendations, you suggested a coordinating body or office within the U.S. government. Where, in your view, should that bully pulpit be? And what would you recommend for its composition outside of U.S. government agencies? How would you interdigitate with the international approach that you did mention at the very end, but I think Dr. Schmidt showed with great granularity, and how would you bring in a community advisory process so that this would not be a deliberative process that would seem to be in the hands of just policy or technologically wonky people? Well, the last thing is obviously the big danger. I think logically it should be at a White House level. You know, it could be work done at the National Science and Technology Council. The National Nanotech Coordinating Office was set up as an independent body that reported up through the White House and was funded essentially by the different agencies. I think that's one model. I think they were consistently underfunded, so you'd have to figure out a way of kind of levying, I think, a certain tax on the agencies to make sure that there was enough money there. So one of the tasks that that office was given was to actually have a national dialogue on nanotechnology, and that never really happened because there really wasn't enough money, enough oomph there. So I think if you did it, you'd have to come up with some way of making sure that there's enough funding going into the coordinating function. The agencies have to be able to pony up some money to make that happen. In terms of advisory bodies, you know you're going to run into FACA issues in terms of the Federal Advisory Act, but it might be worth going through the process to actually set up a FACA that would bring in wide swaths of the population and the communities to be able to sort of get ideas off of. The other option, there's nothing that would stop the government and the agencies from going on the road 
Um, when I was in the White House, we did work on the National Environmental Technology Strategy. We had 25 meetings around the country. Uh, they were just me the, the kind of thing you're doing, but again, they were focused on uh, a specific technology and science area. Um, we ended up also with a White House conference, which is another thing that attract we attracted 1,400 people. So we were constantly bouncing ideas off ideas that have been taken from the government and, and getting lots of different feedback. I would say that one of the things that came out of that was exponential improvement in our strategies uh, because we were able to, to really interact with stakeholders. So I think there's a bunch of different ways. I think the level matters. It has to have White House support. That's where it belongs. Uh, if you have a coordinating body, you have to have enough uh, essentially money behind it to, to make it work. Uh, there has to be some leadership there. And I, I would certainly recommend the use of potentially putting a FACA in place that might help. Uh, thanks again. I think we were uh, treated to three very different but uh, but very, very good uh, uh, presentations. Um, my, uh, my question will be for uh, Dr. Volpe. And, uh, Paul, uh, you probably know there are sort of two, two ways we can think about uh, religious voices participating in public dialogues like the one this commission is uh, uh, conducting. Uh, one strategy is to sort of only give publicly accessible reasons, um, and the second is to allow people of religious communities to speak out of the fullness of their traditions. Um, you seem to have uh, uh, allowed a broader sense of the second kind of participation um, in, in a dialogue like this, and I was wondering what you think the actual, if, if that's true, what the actual value is of allowing people to um, speak out of the thickness of mm -hmm. their own traditions as part of a public debate right. um, about a contentious issue like this one. Well, well, I think the problem with religious perspectives in a in a society that's supposed to have a a, a religion state split is that religious traditions don't get to talk about why they really believe what they believe. If you get up in front of Congress or, or a commission and you say, I think this is wrong because the Quran tells me it's wrong or the Torah or whatever your, your sacred scriptures are, it's, a, it's the end of the conversation, not the beginning of the conversation. You have to translate parochial religious ideas into universal principles if you want to be, um, if you want to be uh, convincing about why you should take actions. But I think underlying the parochial uh, reasons that religious traditions think things are often very deep um, principles that can be universally expressed. And I think that in our society that is the greatest contribution of, of religious traditions because these are well thought out, centuries old, much debated, much um, uh, very nuanced positions. So th that's what I tried to do here, rather than, than reiterating what I think are very easily accessible and commonly discussed religious positions about um, technological issues. I was trying to get underneath the service and, and ask what is, what is the font of concern from which religious objections spring? Well, thank you all three. This has been enormously uh, insightful, informative, and I uh, think it will help us moving forward. So I really like the idea, if you would mind my changing one word, instead of knowledge tempered by wisdom, mm -hmm. knowledge coupled with wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think we as a commission would like to issue a report that is informed by the facts, knowledge, mm -hmm. and um, driven by values, wisdom, uh, mm -hmm. to elevate it a bit. Um, and I'd like to ask any of you to share, I'll, we can start if you want with Paul, um, what are the values that you see us having to mm -hmm. deal with? Um, mm -hmm. what, what are the values that are most relevant to the issue of where synthetic biology is likely to go, the values that we need to deal with mm -hmm. as a presidential commission. Just, I know this is a big question, but just I, I just want to you know you right. could give us one uh, one answer. My answer would be that that it isn't a single values question; it is a balancing of values problem. That is, 
you know, when I talked about the fetishization of scientific progress, I wasn't trying to say that I'm against scientific progress. I'm extraordinarily for it. I uh, live my life in a, in a medical environment and, and celebrate medical advances. But there are other values, too, that have to be brought in. So I think your challenge is not so much what is the value that we should represent in our report that will be the value that, that synthetic biology needs, but rather how do we create a report, and I think temperance might be the right word, that, that takes all of these competing values and, and balances them in a, in a way that makes policy uh, valuable. I should say that while I ask about mm -hmm. values, there was a famous philosopher who said that uh, values without facts are lame. Right. Facts without values are blind. Right. So we're, we take both sides of this. You can speak to either one. I would like to refer to this, uh, the Swiss uh, Bioethics Commission where it entertained different positions um, one, could, uh, one could have, and from that, different values are entertained. And, and there were, for example, thinking about people that um, believe in a kind of monism, that, that every organism can be practically uh, explained or, or reduced to a certain kind of physical chemical properties and laws. And there are other people that uh, still have a vitalistic point of view. They say, no, there's something special in life. There's some X factor that's, that cannot be controlled or engineered. And I think many in synthetic biology, they come from, a, from this monism concept, and that there is a little understanding for this vitalistic idea. And I think uh, this, this, these two positions can get in the way in a way that uh, it's a direct uh, attack, so to say, on the idea that there's some special nest of life. And, um, and, and, and this carries a lot of values, although it's a position that is uh, as unfounded as, as the other one, but uh, it, it's, it's a, a way we, we view life, and if we attack that, or if this is attacked by, the, by synthetic biology, it could, uh, could trigger some uh, strong reactions to that. No? So, I, mean, I, would, I would think that one of the things that would be very useful in the report was a sense of the sensitivity and celebration of plurality. Uh, we, we are a very plural, heterogeneous society. And one of the things that's so striking when we do these focus groups is the huge difference. We talked about religion. There are huge differences between men and women. There are huge differences between whites and people of color and how they view this and the trust issues. And I think um, it would be phenomenal if the report could kind of reflect that, that, that we have a plural society, and we've gone out and we've kind of looked at that, and we've probed deeply into all the little pockets of society. And, and I think that's something that, that, you know, that's what gave rise to quite often resistance, the environmental justice movement, for instance. So I think that's something that you have to do. There's going to be the sense of how, how deep have we gone, how sensitive have we been to, to, to sort of the plurality and the heterogeneity of, of, the, of the society. We're in a different place quite often than a lot of the European countries, and you've got to deal with that. And I think it can be dealt with, and I think it can be dealt with on uh, the basis that, that, that links values with facts. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to, to the panelists. I, I might ask uh, David Rajeski a question, but also open it to the, to the other panelists. Um, there are certainly unique capabilities of synthetic biology, but one of the issues we spoke about yesterday is the overlap in the issues that are raised between this new technology and other uh, technologies, genetic engineering, stem cell biology, even nano technology. And my question is, in terms of the public debate and also the oversight framework, are we um, better uh, isolating synthetic biology or uh, addressing these issues in the larger context of emerging uh, biotechnologies? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you my opinion. I, I think there actually is a certain danger in, in creating different ologies. Um, Twenty years ago, the U.S. government made a, just, a, 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 a whether it was a conscious or unconscious decision, that our goal was to basically build another industrial revolution by gaining control of matter at a nano scale, at a biologically relevant scale. And we started with nanotech, and that was focused largely on inorganic matter. And now we've moved to organic matter. This is all about precision control of matter. And that's going to change the way we make everything for the next 100 years. 
And so this idea of separating things, I mean, one of the things that was striking when you saw some of the slides was that they mentioned nanotechnology, right? And so there's people up at MIT that have actually re-engineered viruses to make batteries. And so the nano folks have been wait, they've been talking for 10 years about self-replicating nano things. Well, biology does that, and now we're in a position to program it. And, and obviously, Drew mentioned this idea of this ability to decouple bits from atoms and program the bits and address them back to the world of atoms. So I think uh, the National Science Foundation has talked for years about converging technologies, it's the nano and the info and the bio world. And so I think it, it, there, is, there is some value in thinking about the fact that these are all coming together now and asking the question about, well, how will the regulatory system work? Um, and will the Toxic Substance Control Act work well with nanotech and nanobiotech? Because they're all starting to get more complex. And you could do the same exercise through most of the U.S. statutes and most of the U.S. agencies. So I think there's a tension there. There's quite often it's, it seems conceptually easier to break it down, um, but I don't think that's what we're going to end up in 20 years. I think you're going to see a – you're already seeing a tremendous kind of convergence. And there's also lessons to be learned, as, as we've already talked about, I think. Let me ask the uh, audience if there is a question or two. Wow, a large number of questions. I, I tell you, why don't I collect your questions, and then we'll let, let them run through them. So, so give me your question. I'll note it down, and then we'll – And introduce yourself. Yeah, introduce yourself, and then we'll turn the uh, – uh, turn our panelists loose on you. Please. Um, my question was for Dr. Smith, and it was basically, is there a need for an international standard um, for biotechnology, or synthetic biology, but biotechnology in general as well? Introduce Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Oh, I'm Sahil Joshi. Um, I'm a student at Dartmouth College. Welcome. Good to have you here. How about the other microphone, back microphone? Hi, I'm Gerald Epstein at the Center for Science, Technology, and Security Policy at the AAAS. I guess this is for David Rejewski. I have a pocket hobby of collecting policy studies whose recommendations include the president needs to make this a personal mission. And in terms of a White House office or a U.S. government-wide office, is this – maybe it's related to the last question we had from the panel. Is this technology so special it really needs a special White House office, or does that office have to pick a number and stand in line behind the – White House Office for Neuroscience, the White House Office for Biomedics, the White House Office yeah. for Quantum and what would And what would be the priority for that? Yeah. Yeah. Do we need lots of them, or is this so special? Good question. Back to the front microphone. Hi, I'm Nicole Gaddis from University of Pennsylvania. My question is for Mr. Rajeski and Dr. Schmidt. I was wondering if there's been an opportunity to investigate the impact of educating young people before college and the impact of public perception on science advancing technologies or synthetic biology in particular. Got it. Thank you. Back microphone. Hi, I'm Heather Lowry from the Nation Centre at the University of Edinburgh, and um, I have a question. It's for Mr. Rajeski and Dr. Schmidt as well. What do you think – I really enjoyed your focus on um, comparisons between Europe and the US. What do you think can be learned from trade-related conflicts that have arisen in the case of genetic modification between Europe and the US? Because this technology is going to fit into existing regulatory frameworks. What do, what do we need to learn from what's happened in the case of GM crops in particular? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry. I didn't get good notes on that one. Uh, <laughs> down, so I, I made sure I understand the question, please. I, I was asking what could be learned from the, – the key point is what can be learned from trade-related conflicts that have arisen between the U.S. and Europe and other countries as well in the case of existing genetic modification technologies. Um, what, what can we learn going forward for synthetic biology? I, I have it. Thank Jim you. Jim just wanted to hear you speak so yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. Just beautiful. In front microphone, yes. Hi, my name is Colleen Lyons. I've got two questions. The first is around the Belmont Report um, and, and as a, a values discussion. So I thought it was appropriate, or, or I'd ask you, how appropriate is that as a jumping point to investigate values in today's social context? Uh, the second thing is regarding education. Um, what role can the House of Representatives play as a platform for educating their constituents uh, this that's a general question. Thank you. And finally, in the back. Uh, my name is Donald Brayman. I'm a professor of law at George Washington University yes. and a uh, um, member of the Cultural Cognition Project and actually got to participate and collaborate with David Rajeski as part of the Cognition Project on some of the work they've done. I wanted to second um, what they said, uh, what uh, David and Marcus said about the potential for polarization and the need for evidence-based science communication and deliberation strategies. Um, 
maybe I'll make it a little starker than, than uh, David and Marcus did. Um, deliberation can, can work and bring people together if done right, but done wrong, it can really push people to the polls um, and create a lot of conflict and polarization. So um, uh, we're lucky to have generous funding from the National Science Foundation um, as they are in doing research on just this sort of thing. There are plenty of researchers out there looking at how to do science-based education. So I just urge the commission to make uh, evidence-based science communication um, a deliberate and a formal part of their report to the president. I appreciate that. And you're with GW Law, is that what you said? That's right, in the Cultural Cognition Project at the Yale Law School. That's how we can find you. Good. Uh, I was hoping these would converge into bins. And uh, and actually, there's at least one bin, and that was around communication and education. Uh, Thoughts about young people uh, and and focusing education toward them, the role of our Congress in educating constituents, uh, and I think the comment uh, comment there at the end. What about... uh, the education dimension of communications, gentlemen. Yes, Mark. In, in one of our projects, uh, cinema and synthetic biology, we have one, um, one work package where we take film clips from Hollywood blockbuster movies that have something to do with uh, synthetic biology, like, for example, Jurassic Park, to find uh, huh. uh, sequence the DNA and make the, the dinosaur, now, which was science fiction in 1993, but now we have... It's not totally science fiction now. And we take this and try to... Um, uh, combine it with uh, like scientific facts about what is possible right now, what could be possible in the future, what should be done with should it, should it be done, what are the consequences, and make like uh, high school packages for teachers so they can be used in school. Um, I think it's one way to engage uh, people yeah, uh, below university grade uh, in this in this debate. I mean, this is a general strategy in any new technology. Also, people that uh, work on climate change and try to go to schools and inform uh, young people they're still open. Um, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was invited in, uh, at a uh, Viennese school. I uh, was 14 years, years old, uh, high school students, and it was very interesting. I gave a presentation about the, synth- uh, the synthetic genome and the cell, and the children were very interested, and for them it was new, but as new as any other thing that was new. Actually, they're, they're more surprised were the teachers. They said, what, what are you talking to me? Is it real or is it a joke? But <laughs> the, the, the children understood it's not a joke, but the teachers didn't. So I think they were more smart in, in that, grasping that. <laughs> is that right? Wonderful. Uh, and options for, uh, for educating uh, Congress. And let's couple that with this question about the need for a White House office. Is that the right level, and should it have high priority there? Um, I think there is a tremendous need to obviously get Congress up to speed on, on lots of uh, emerging technologies. Um, I, I think before the, the congressional folks can kind of educate their constituencies, they, they need to get educated themselves. Um, and so the Congress uses a, a system called caucuses. Um, so for years they had the nanotechnology caucus, uh, and we work with them pretty intensively. And, and basically they bring people in um, to brief um, members that are in the caucus. And, and I think that's a model that could be used with synthetic biology. One might even be able to build off the nano caucus. Uh, so I think that's that's a starting point. That gets the staff involved. It gets the members that's involved. Um, and the caucus model is, is well known in the Congress. Thank you. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I mean, I agree that we probably don't need another White House office. Um, but one option, since we, we talked about this issue of things coming together, uh, would be to build off, off the coordinating office that does nanotech and do nanobio. Um, so that we're not actually doing another office. We're just kind of admitting that this is kind of where the, t- the science and technology is going. Um, and, and we kind of expand that to take on some of the synthetic bio uh, issues. Um, so we're not putting in place an, another, another White House entity, but just expanding it around this idea of converging technologies. Final theme we heard from the, uh, from the audience, were, were international theme, uh, the need for a uh, question around the need for international standards. What can we learn about uh, the existing uh, uh, conflict resolutions and, and agreements uh, for genetic modification between the U.S. and Europe. Perhaps even we can uh, whoops, ask you to comment on the, the values of the Dunlop report in this, mm-hmm. in this last grouping. Who wants to comment? I just want to say, I, I think what you find when you look internationally, and not just the United States and Europe, over biotechnology in general, is certain areas of convergence of, of values and certain areas of, of divergence. And so you have activities, you know, uh, for example, and this isn't SynBio, but you have... Um, 
in China, um, you know, the um, genetic engineering of, of a human nucleus into a rabbit, em uh, rabbit ovum and then taking that to a certain number of cells, which is something that wouldn't happen in the United States. I think it is crucial as these technologies progress that we try to come to some set of international standards. It is, you know, while we can impose standards in our own countries and we can have uh, multi-country uh, um, agreements, it is undermined in these particular kinds of technologies if there are rogue state, states, so to speak, that are doing things that are completely outside the bounds of, of the regulatory system set up by treaty or by agreement or even by some kind of international regulation. And so we have a very, very difficult problem of trying to figure out how to universalize a set of standards for sci scientific progress as these technologies get so much more powerful. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in terms of technical standards, it's, it's uh, incredibly important. I may remind you that uh, the, uh, one of the NASA uh, Mars uh, landers uh, it collapsed. It, it oh. couldn't uh, go into the, uh, the Mars because there was a misunderstanding between inches and centimeters, so it's yes, very recall. important. And, and uh, the TARPOL uh, project, uh, they organized um, a meeting, uh, a workshop early this year where our representatives from the U.S. and Europe were sitting together in order to talk about standards and uh, technical standards. But if you talk about uh, biosafety standards, I think it's also important to have these. Um, also in, in relation to like international trade, like I, I mentioned this, uh, one of the recommendations by the European Group on Ethics was that uh, the things that got imported or exported from or outside the, United, uh, the European uh, Union, they should, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, be acceptable or, and fall under the European um, kind of laws and regulations. So they have so, so um, countries that want to import or export into the European Union have to adopt this uh, this standards. That would make incredibly sense. On the other hand, I think I agree with uh, you that standards should not um, limit exploration of new ideas, and there should be some kind of diversity as well. Uh, yeah. um, I agree with the, the need for for the international standard setting. Uh, let me take you in the other direction. Um, we, we live in a large country, and quite often when uh, there's some hesitancy by the federal government, state and local governments move. Um, so the, the first municipality that put in place a biotechnology ordinance was Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's been in place since 1976, and there's 55 biotech companies in Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge put in place a nanotech ordinance, so did Berkeley, and California is moving hard on setting up their own system to take care of nanotech issues. Uh, we know that from the history of air pollution control, water, whatever topic you pick, um, you've got a huge system. We have our own EU here. And so I think one of the things you have to be sensitive to is the fact that somebody may decide to move ahead of you. Uh, that drives industry crazy because not only do they have to deal with disaggregation in an international level, but now they're dealing with disaggregation and disaggregated markets at, at a local level. Um, so I think it's important to keep your eye on, 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 on local government and states. Absolutely right. Um, Anita and Christine, can you get your questions answered at break time, or, or would you? I, I'd appreciate that. Let's, uh, let us, first of all, uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. Wolpe and Schmidt and uh, Dr. Jeske so much for their contribution. One, wonderful. Uh, we will reconvene in 10 minutes, a quarter to the hour, for the final, uh, final session.